Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and I'm also very excited to see that SpaceX's launch schedule is kicking back into action after the rapid unplanned disassembly, or the RUD as people call it, on September the 1st in 2016 at Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. Now, SpaceX also liked to refer to this particular event as the Anomaly, which you can read the full report on on this Anomaly update page in the news section of the SpaceX website. Now, what we're doing here is launching the mock Iridium mission that's coming up here on the Falcon 9 with the Realism Overhaul mods installed in Kerbal Space Program. Now, this should give an approximate preview of the upcoming mission targeted for sometime next week. Let's hope it all goes smoothly, of course, as we are all having, I think you'll all agree, a very big withdrawal of SpaceX launches since this anomaly occurred. Now, I won't talk a lot about what caused this previous rapid unplanned disassembly because Scott Manley has a great video about it linked here, so check that out. It will be linked here and in the description. To just quickly summarize this, however, the fault is believed to have been caused by a composite overwrapped pressure vessel, or COPV as they're quite often called, inside the second stage liquid oxygen tank. Now, they think that the extremely low temperature of the liquid oxygen actually may have caused solid oxygen to build up between the helium tank's inner aluminum structure and the outer overwrap. Now, all this sort of thing then increases the chance of a friction ignition. In the short term, SpaceX will be reverting their loading operations to pre-proven configurations, but in the long term, SpaceX will apparently be implementing some design changes to the composite overwrapped pressure vessels to prevent this same issue from occurring. Elon Musk recently tweeted that the hold down firing of the Falcon 9 at Vandenberg's space launch complex had been completed and that all systems are go for a launch sometime over the next week. Now SpaceX have launched from Vandenberg multiple times before, in fact their first commercial flight in 2013, which was coincidentally the maiden flight of the Falcon 9 version 1.1, was also launched from Vandenberg. The Jason 3 satellite was then launched in 2016 into a near polar orbit where they would have stuck the landing if it wasn't for that damn darn landing leg giving way. <laughs> I've got to say actually, this always reminds me of that quote by Get Smart. <laughs> Missed it by that much. So just coming up to around 1800 meters per second, which is around the time when we'll have main engine cut off to actually launch our second stage. The second stage vacuum engine, of course, is optimized to be much more efficient in a vacuum up at this very high altitude as it's escaping the atmosphere. You do, of course, need a much longer and wider rocket nozzle when you are firing an engine in a vacuum, but that is a story for another video. We just need to wait until we've completely left the atmosphere before we drop these fairings. Of course, our first stage is then going to flip. It's going to come back around and it's going to come down on the drone ship, hopefully in a more successful manner than what it did with Jason 3. Just switching back to our stage two here, we're going to be dropping these fairings here fairly soon, as soon as we pass around oh, 1900 meters per second. And there they go there. Separating the fairings as early as possible in your ascent increases the performance of that stage too. Now that we've dropped those fairings, we can return now to stage one so that we can prepare for our landing burn. Now this particular vessel isn't going to have enough fuel left in the first stage to make it all the way back to the base to land on land, so it's going to be landing on the drone ship of course. This also means that we don't need to spend a lot of fuel doing any sort of boost back burn. All we actually need to do is reverse thrust just enough so that we don't damage our engines on re-entry. So the upcoming launch from Vandenberg Space Launch Complex will boost 
10 Iridium Next satellite phone relay stations into orbit. Now, just because Kerbal Space Program doesn't have an easy way of arranging satellites here equally around the vessel in groups of five, I've actually placed 12 satellites here because we can easily attach in a symmetry six. You get the idea here though. I don't know exactly what the masses of these satellites would be, so I've got what I think would be an appropriate mass for each of these to simulate the launch into orbit. Generally, satellites of this nature weigh around 800 kilograms or so. I believe these satellites will be fueled with hydrazine, so they can be quite heavy. Apparently, this launch will actually be the heaviest payload launched by SpaceX to date, I believe. So fingers crossed that it all goes well and that they can boost it all successfully to orbit and of course, stick the landing. Now currently it seems that SpaceX are contracted to deliver 70 of these Iridium satellites into orbit. I would assume most launches would be groups of 10 like this, but presumably groups of 5 could also be launched in combination with other payloads, so there will be many more launches of this type to come. Our stage two here, almost now at 4,000 meters per second. That is actually only half the velocity needed to get into a low Earth orbit. And you can see from our fuel indicator in the bottom left that we have less than half a tank of fuel left. But that's okay, as we drain the fuel, the vessel becomes more and more efficient, so it will get there. Just coming up here now to our re-entry burn. As soon as we start hitting the atmosphere, we need to reduce a lot of our velocity using our engines. We started here at over 2000 meters per second. We want to reduce our velocity by more than half. Of course, because we don't have stage two attached anymore, it's got a massive thrust to weight ratio this stage one now. So you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, the G meter has spun right up there into the red. That'll do for now though, we'll switch back to stage two. Now in stage two here, you might be wondering why it is that I'm pointing up 20 degrees on the nav ball. And actually the nav ball there is upside down, which is probably confusing some of you. The line between the brown and the blue is the horizon. We're pointing slightly upwards towards the sky around 20 degrees there. You'll see there in the top left hand corner that I am doing a physics warp here too. So we're running at two times the normal speed. So in reality, this launch will be taking twice as long. You'll see there from time to time, I'm moving myself up and down on the nav ball, changing my direction of thrust. And that's essentially just to keep our time to apoapsis down at around zero seconds or as close as I can get to that. Our orbital velocity is getting right up there now towards 7,000 meters per second. Accelerating very quickly now. We'll switch back over to stage one, ready to do our landing in the ocean. Just quickly dropping out our air brakes because I didn't have them tied to an action group. Also dropping out our landing legs. Using just our central engine to do our landing burn here just as we touch down. Just trying to do a touchdown in that suicide burn kind of way that SpaceX so much loves to do. Sadly though, I don't have a drone ship out here to land on. But here is one of my favorite clips from the CRS-8 launch. <laughs> how, how damn good is that? That is just so awesome. I hope we get to see this again in a few days time. So after the second stage reaches a polar orbit, the 10 satellites will separate from the core deployment module created by SpaceX. Tests will then be run on the Iridium satellites for three months to check that all the systems are working as they should. They will then maneuver into their operational constellation. These satellites are a big deal for Iridium and they are said to be spending around $3 billion on this new satellite program. The current satellite network they have is now quite old, having been launched, I believe, between 1997 and 2002. So an upgrade is definitely needed. These satellites are essentially going to replace the current constellation of 66 satellites that they have in place. So they are going to switch a new satellite for the old one, one at a time. 
So the landing attempt will again be on the drone ship, just read the instructions. This is again the same drone ship used back in the Jason 3 launch last year, and interestingly I recently found out that both drone ships, just read the instructions and, of course I still love you, were named after vessels in a novel called The Player of Games, which is a science fiction book that I'm currently in the process of reading, so give that a crack if you're into such things. Thank you for watching, I hope you're looking forward to the launch as much as I am. Please do take a second to give this video a thumbs up, all of your support helps a huge amount. If you have any questions for me, please do whack them down in the comments below. Thanks very much to all of you that have subscribed, and for those that haven't yet, please do subscribe to see more. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video. So, although there are performance losses due to the reusability of the boosters, it is well worth the cost. As said many times by SpaceX, reusability is the key to making human life multi-planetary. And this is the real inspiring end goal, and it will allow humans to transport.